This is Watkins. Welcome with Bridget Fetacy. I'm Bridget Fetacy, and you are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> You know the drill. Please subscribe, rate, comment, share, reach out, tell your friends, send smoke signals, whatever. We love your feedback and we want to hear from you. Our sponsors this week are Freshly and Calm. Freshly is amazing. They offer chef-made, nutrient-packed, delicious meals delivered fresh to your door. Go to freshly.com slash walk-in for $40 off your first two orders. For listeners of the show, Calm is offering a special limited time promotion of 40% off a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash walkin. This week on the podcast, I sit down with my friend and brilliant writer, Nancy Rommelman. She's a journalist who writes for Reason, Newsweek, The Wall Street Journal, and other publications. Her latest book is To the Bridge, A True Story of Motherhood and Murder. She is the co-founder of Paloma Media, subscribe to their YouTube channel, and writes the substack Make More Pie. Subscribe to that too. We have a very just free-flowing conversation because we're friends, so you might feel like you're out to lunch with a bunch of buddies, and I hope, I hope that that's how you feel. I'm with Nancy <laughs> Rommelman, everybody. Welcome to Watkins. Welcome. Bridget, thank you. Another one who I feel is way overdue on this podcast. Yeah, but we ate dinner together, at least like in person, even no, during the true. whole pandemic. We got to know each other a little bit, which was super nice. I yeah. feel like most of my friends haven't been on. It's funny. I, I mean, I'd love to get, you know, Bethany Mandel is a good friend of mine mm -hmm. and she's I, I just haven't had her on yet. I have I feel like a lot of my real life friends I haven't had on yet. And they're really interesting. Well, she's a little busy, you know. Uh, yeah, with her five and children another, or and whatever. another one on the way. Yeah, and the pandemic and yeah, all this, and yeah. homeschooling I, we're gonna give, five kids. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's no problem. Come on, <laughs> Bethany, get it together. Get on Bridget's show. She would too. She would. <laughs> so tell us just a little bit about who you are. I I know most of my audience is familiar with you and your work, and uh, I just did my little fantasy dot com workout with the ladies, and they all said to say hi. They love you. They're really excited. Hi, everyone. Uh, who am I? I am a journalist and an author. I'm originally from New York City, from Brooklyn. Uh, went out to L.A. Uh, as a young adult, had a baby, became a journalist, wrote for L.A. Weekly and tons of other places, moved up to Portland in 2004, kept doing journalism up there, um, and uh, wrote a book that came out a couple years ago called To the Bridge, A True Story of Motherhood and Murder. Go get that, please, on uh, Amazon. And um and then came back to New York, which I, I always knew I would do at some point in 2019, late 2019, and am here. But uh, last year, when all the uh, the MAGA riots, as Matt Welch has named them, started <laughs> in uh, in Portland, I went back and started reporting for Reason Magazine and um, wrote 14 stories covering what was going on in the ground there. And I uh, have a big feature dropping, which I think uh, we're that, going to be talking it's about. It's that out. Oh, my God. That's right. It's out. Uh, called uh, the, Dream the Future. Of we are in the future. The, you, you look amazing for in the future. Um, uh, the Dream of the 90s died in Portland. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to um, be reporting on this story for Reason, which I think is one of the few places in the country that's actually interested in not um, sort of reporting with a mission. They're sort mm -hmm. of interested in what's going on. Mm -hmm. And that's the way I like to write stories. So I, I feel super lucky to be um, reporting for them. And actually, just today, I decided I think I'm going to buy a car next month. and. Um, drive around the country and do some more reporting, um, including, including from Portland. So, uh, so stay tuned. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll pick you up. Yeah. We can there we go. Little, so, um, yeah. Road trip together. Yeah. I can, mean, I, I, my husband won't, I was like, can we get an RV? And he's like, absolutely not. <laughs> oh, like, well, I'm not going to be in an RV, but I do have to drive like Oklahoma. I mean, you know, maybe I'll just like swing through to LA and we'll just drive up the five. There we well, go. if I'm still here, I might be closer. <gasps> I might be where, closer to the middle. Where? Oh, to the middle of the country? Yeah, I don't I don't know where yet, but I, I'm not lying for Los Angeles. I keep saying that. Gee, but, but Bridget, why? Why on earth? What could possibly be going wrong <laughs> in California? I, you know, the, you know, that we talked about this when you were here and we had dinner and I generally like cities when they're a little bit more gritty. I actually was like, oh, L.A. has been a little too shiny. 
but this is a little too gritty and it seems like it's only getting worse and more dangerous. And so as conditions escalate, I, I don't really have enough. And I was talking to my aunt and uncle who are in a different tax bracket than me. And, you know, I'm, I was saying it's, I don't have enough money to really insulate me from what's actually happening in LA right now. And if you have enough money, you can kind of maintain that bubble. I think you, you'll see it, but you're still behind a wall or in a gated community or et cetera. But I'm still, you know, working class. And so I don't have, yeah, I don't even really feel safe walking my dog. So, so when you say what's happening in LA, you know, I'm here in New York city and obviously I look at all the, just the, the inanity. I, I, I saw part of Gavin Newsom's press conference from a couple of days ago. And okay. I, I don't pay a whole lot of attention to him because I don't live in LA anymore, but I listened to five minutes and I, I'm, I'm not saying this to try to be like cynical or funny or anything. I did not hear one syllable of authenticity. Yeah, no. And I was like, how did his hair get him this far? And 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 who are you holding hostage now? So when you say what's going on in LA, like you don't have school aged children, but obviously we have a lot of friends that are suffering mm -hmm. uh, not being able to go outside and, and people's businesses not being able to open, which we've we've seen in a lot of places, but but I think California more than any place. So for you personally, how do you feel? What what's going on that your lifestyle is just like, I can't do this anymore or I won't uh, do this anymore? I did my taxes. Uh, that's one thing. <gasps> I have a small business. I walk yeah. out my door and I see filth everywhere on the streets, in the streets. There's, I don't feel safe walking my dog. At least every time I go out, I have to divert or go some other way because there's something crazy. There was there. It's just drastically changed. I've been here long enough to, I drive around and everything's boarded up, closed down. Downtown Santa Monica looks just, it's depressing. It's basically open air mental ward down in Santa Monica. Now it's wild. Venice is this, basically an encampment. I mean, I don't know how anyone paying the taxes who is a homeowner in L.A. is rationalizing this to themselves because it feels like decisions were made and they I'm I'm fine with helping the homeless. I'm fine with helping anybody in need. I, I just don't think that you, that should come at the expense of every single other person. And it does seem like I keep describing it as feeling like I'm in a city that's in ho like on hospice it's it feels wow it feels like when i moved here it was vibrant you couldn't get a place there was this upsurge of creative energy you had to be ready to put money down there were tons of young people it was still affordable for young people relative to san francisco and new york and now it's insanely and I, I'm and I'm really not sure. There's a part of me that's convinced that tech does this wherever it goes because tech destroyed San Francisco. It seems like it destroyed Seattle. I'm not really sure what happened in Portland, but in tech has definitely moved into L.A. in the past five years. And it, it exacerbates the wealth inequality in a city. Um, well, it certainly did that um, in San Francisco for yep. sure. I mean, yeah, because oh. it inflates the, uh, the there is a if there's a housing shortage, those people who can't get a house are able to pay more for rent and then it boots out the middle class. And now basically you're, you're seeing that in L.A. It's just I mean, you need two hundred and fifty to three hundred thousand dollars to get into a house in L.A. That oh, at least down payment, at least. I mean, that's who has that other than like trust fund babies, people in tech and people who made smart decisions from the time that they were 18 years old. <laughs> I mean, when we were looking, one of the reasons we moved up to Portland, uh, I lived TikTok in TikTok stars. <laughs> uh, yeah. me. I had an amazing house in Los Feliz. I mean, gorgeous with a yard and a back house and, and a list used to be a Shriners bar in the basement and it was big and it was beautiful for $1,600 a month. Okay. Wow. Which was crazy. And this yeah. was in 2004. We had rented it for, for six years and we were looking for a house at that time and houses then um, for us were, were like $600,000. I mean, wow. I'm a freelance journalist. My husband was a contractor, but this was like right before the, you know, well, when they were throwing money at people, we, we had this uh, realtor, we called him the golden ferret. And he would, <laughs> he would look at us and he'd be like, I can get you into a house for $800,000 with no money down. And I'm like, 
are you high? And people were like, it was like they'd all been infected and bitten by zombies. They were like, oh, I'm going to buy this house. We saw a house in Silver Lake that literally had no floor. It had been burnt through because bums had been living there. And he's like, you better snap this up fast because this will be gone by the end of the day because the, the money was so cheap. And right. I remember saying to my husband, I was like, this is not going to last. Right. There's no way that this can last because you can't give people that make $47,000 a year an $800,000 <laughs> loan. <laughs> and lo and behold, yep. but we were able to afford in Portland. We, we got a really nice house because at that time, you know, it was still pretty middle class. It yeah. wasn't, it, it hadn't become the city that everybody wanted to go to. Mm -hmm. So we were lucky. And we just, uh, we just sold that house, by the way, uh, last uh, November. Oh. We, we got out. Yeah. You know, we we were one of the people that, you know, you're saying I am no longer willing to stay in Los Angeles because of the things that kept me here are either gone or corroding. Um, and, you know, obviously, Bridget, cities, they will revivify. No, will. Some, sometimes a city will like, you know, Pompeii or something. I don't know. You'll, you, you know, it'll be a long time before it comes back. Cities will come back. Of course. Los Angeles will come back. Portland will come back. But in the meantime, um, people that, you know, uh, you know, the kind of creative capital and brain trust stuff and money stuff. So people are like, you know what, I, I'm going to go do something else for a while. Cause yeah. right now this is uncomfortable or disgusting and, and I'm out. So, um, and so it's, I, yeah. it's just like I on Hersey and I were talking about, you broke the contract, you know, that what mm -hmm. you, I, the, the only reason I see government is necessary is to what point is there if I don't feel safe in my own, in any city, you don't feel necessarily safe. I'm not saying you should feel safe wherever you go all the time. There's always dangers, particularly if you're a woman, whether you're in the rural suburbs or anywhere. But just the level of filth and um, it's not the same city. I mean, it's the crime. Somebody got shot in their leg in Beverly Hills. They were getting mugged. Someone got mugged in the neighborhood down the street. By They got stabbed. I mean, it this is pretty common and happening more and more. And I, I pay too much money in taxes to have children who are vulnerable and falling behind and minority kids and disabled kids and kids who are being abused, not in school for whatever freaking reason. I don't even have kids. I just, I volunteered with kids who are down in, um, in, the like the Watts area kind of well more South Central area and I don't know what these kids are doing because they went to this program after school and that's where they had tutors and their parents were both working I don't know how are you know you hear these stories from teachers like 30 percent of their classes don't aren't logging in and we pay an exorbitant amount of money in taxes in California. My my state taxes were almost as much as my federal taxes this year. <laughs> it's like that's bananas. That's nuts. Yeah, and this is going to be the. I actually still uh, am since I I was still owned a home and everything, and still had voted in in or or no, I actually changed my voters registration, but still still paying uh, taxes in Oregon. Um, but that'll change probably next year because because I'm here. But you know, nature as the as it goes, nature abhors a, vo abhors a void. So yeah. you know what moves in. I remember um, after the housing bubble burst, um, you had these, you know, these, these developments, people were going to make a mint and they never had sold because they, you know, the timing was bad. And all of a sudden, who do you have living there? You've got people that are just going to be like, wow, here's an empty house. Yep. Like I will come and live here. And so when you have, let's say San Francisco and you, you know, San Francisco was always pretty mixed up in many ways. I, when I met my husband, he lived in San Francisco and, you know, he was working as like a, you know, a bartender at a, at a, at a bar south of market, but his best, his roommate was a, um, was a rocket scientist at right. Lockheed. <laughs> right. And like, and it was like, you could go around and yeah, there were places where there was like poop on the street and needles, but there was also right. like, you could go up to, you know, wherever and you go to go get, it was like, really, I like you, I kind of, not that I like poop on the street, but I like a, a city that's mixed up, right? Yeah. You want to have a lot of different neighborhoods, a lot of different kinds of yeah. people. That's the kind of good friction. And it keeps things in tension because you've got enough people on, on either side. But then, yeah, you get tech that moves in and the stuff on South of Market where he used to be, which was like, just nuts is now these incredible million dollar condos. So clearly those folks have to move out, except some of them can't go anywhere. So they're kind of like on the edges. Oh, well then those people flee the condos and you've just got like, you know, uh, uh, downtown Portland, 
also looks the way you're saying um, Santa Monica looks. Yeah. I mean, downtown Portland, literally, I was there. Actually, whoa, this was even pre um, the pandemic. It was Christmas time, 19, 2019. And things were just kind of going in the shitter. And I was walking around downtown and I was like, huh, literally like 30% of the businesses were boarded over. Now that's not yeah. normal. That is just yeah. not normal. So this is pre-pandemic, pre-George Floyd. All right. Things were already, I'd already left. And a friend of mine who has opened a bunch of businesses, they're really hot shit girl who I love, who's actually quoted in my article that is coming out. Burke? That, that, that came out. Name, Burke? Jesse, Jesse Burke. Okay. Um, she said to me, you know, Nancy, Portland is losing its creative capital. Yep. It's losing its it's losing its intellectuals. It's losing people that just have decided. I think you put it very well. The con contract was broken, not just the contract that we might have with the government. Like, hi, could you pick up the garbage? Because my garbage and water bill in Portland was like insane. Yeah. OK, it was so, so, so high. But the contract's been broken with look, times change. Yes. New people come in. I get it. You know, there's a conveyor belt. We start at the beginning and we fall off the end. And that's the way life goes. Right. But the churn. Yes. That's oh, here I go. Yep. But, but there is sort of a contract that we've got kind of like a social contract, right? That we will, you know, we're going to disagree and we might have debates in public. I used to run it. Um, I actually used to run a debate series at one of my husband's coffee places back in like 2010. And it was great, man. We had people, I mean, I had one guy who got so hot under the collar. He was, um, I don't know if you've heard of the Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. He yeah. was like, okay, he was actually a professor from up in um, some college in Washington who was kind of like pro Rajneesh. And he was debating this guy um, whose name I'm now escaping, uh, who had been, oh, Wynn McCormick, who had been very anti Rajneesh. And I got the two of them up there. And the pro Rajneesh guy, got so worked up. He was like 80. He ripped off his shirt and started jumping up and down going, oh, go, oh, go, oh, go. Oh, and that's Imit like the breathing exercise. It, yes. Yeah. It was imitating. It was like, hey, that's what you did. People were like pie eyed. And the place also was packed. We had like 140 people in there, which wasn't that big a cafe. And he stormed out. He 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 picked up his briefcase, storms out without his shirt on, leaving him. I'm sorry, this sounds terrible. He had his slumped over like 70 something wife who only had one breast you could tell just because of the way she was dressed and like leaves her there oh, and then God. has to like come back and grab her and take her out it was so stunning i was kind of mortified but people are like no 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 this is the best like this is what we want we want to be able to have like kind of crazy disagreements because yeah. we're curious well portland decided around 2016 that that was no you weren't going to do that anymore. Like we're seeing now, you and I could literally sit here for the next 10 hours and talk about just the people this week or this month that you're no longer allowed to like have any disagreement about or have tweeted something 10 years ago. It's like, no, you're out. Well, yeah. Portland, Portland didn't used to be that way. It was like a lot of people didn't really care. They're like, whatever, whatever this uh, media shit is. But um, that's not the way it is anymore. Yeah. It's, a, it's a very progressive place where people are scared sometimes with reason to, to speak their mind. And it's also become sort of a dangerous um, place in some ways because of the defunding of the police, not in most areas, but, but in some areas. I wrote about that this morning. So yeah, you break the social, social contract in a city, people are going to be like, I want to go where I can do my work. Okay. I'm a journalist who writes about um, sensitive subjects. I got to be able to place where I can, where I can do that without being afraid that, you know, they're going to come and um, throw shit at, on my doorstep or um, run my husband's business out of business. Like I can't, I can't do that. So right. I came to a place where in New York where there's tons of people and they're like, yeah, do your thing, Nancy. So. And that is what they did to your husband's business. Yeah. Correct? Yeah. Because you know, you're, you're, you're not allowed to um, you're whatever. That's a, that's a whole nother story, which I got to tell you, I'm kind of bored by oh, because yeah. it's just like, you know what? It's it's like, here, go ahead. Look up any of these campaigns. You know what happened. Exactly. And so here we are. So, and you know what? And we're still standing and happy. And he's over in La Paz, like sitting by the pool in the sunshine. And I'm getting to write about what I want to write about. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah. I, I think that out of those, you know, this, this podcast in particular is about grit and resilience. And I think those weird moments in life where your for your hand is forced a bit in ways I was just talking about this where my my kind of worlds collided. I was teaching yoga 
and I was working with kids who had aut- autism and that was wow. kind of my grind while I was also writing. And then I started doing stand up comedy and I had <laughs> fetish and I started my first stand up comedy routine was all about my porn addiction. And I, I was like, Oh, well I was using my stage name Bridget fetish and my real, I was like, eh, and my world's absolutely collided. And it, it was horrible at the time. I mean, it, it brought me to my knees in many ways. And it was a very painful moment in my life and publicly painful. The school like slandered me and the, these kids who I just adored. It was, it was awful. And I ended up, it forced me to choose, you know, I kind of had feet in two worlds and I was like, all right, I guess I'm going to just go wait tables and write and do I, you know, obviously I have to like choose a lane. <laughs> I can't yeah. be like, uh, and so it did. It forced me to really commit in a in a way to uh and find a you know, I'm a I think that you and I are similar in that you're you'll figure out a way. You'll uh, you'll absolutely. reinvent yourself. Uh, it just there's there's I mean, one thing that I have noticed, you know, since leaving Portland and also really, really since the pandemic, is that I don't know what it is. I guess I just plugged into it, but the amount of opportunity there is is absolutely nuts. Like every day I'm getting up and like, oh, this person wants to do this thing. Oh, or, oh my God, I could do this. I, I told you right before we, uh, we got on here, I've got a little, uh, I, I've told you about it. You're, you're, I love your list. Oh, I gotta, I gotta ask for your listeners. So guys go over to YouTube and uh, plug in Paloma Media NYC and go become a subscriber. Will you? It's free. And I, I'm trying to get to a thousand subscribers here. Oh, I'm, at, I'm at 600. So, um, because once you get there and you got some hours, you can, you got a lot more latitude to do a lot more stuff. But anyway, Matt Walsh and I like threw this up there and it's like, oh, and now I can do this. Oh, and now yeah. I can go in clubhouse. Oh, and now I can slip stack. Oh, and now this person wants, oh, you saw me here and now I can do this. It is never, it's actually never ending. Yeah. If you, if you plug into that or you can say like, I've been defeated by the little bitches and I'm never going to be able to do anything ever again. Or I could be like super bitter and sour and yell a lot. It's like, why? It's like, so there's so much cool stuff to do, including right before I got on here, trying to figure out the green screen and the lights. And I've got dish towels hanging over the lights. And it's like, well, so, so what? Fun. Yeah. So what? I'm going to put out content tonight. I got my, my editor from Newsweek is coming over. We're going to sit there and talk about some shit. And it's like, you just do it. Yeah. And um, that's, I, I find that that has been an interesting, um, the things that you couldn't do during the pandemic. And I mean, I guess this holds true for all eternity, but the things you couldn't do in the pandemic, it's like, okay, but what can I do? Right. And that's, fun. and, and, yeah. and is the new way. So it is. Yeah. It's, it's interesting that I've always seen this amount of opportunity, particularly with the internet. It just seemed to level the playing field mm-hmm. and remove so many of the gatekeepers. And I read a book, the rise of the creative class um, years ago. I think it came out in 2005 or 2006 predicting exactly this moment where it was mm-hmm. just, but this is, you know, this kind of goes back to the piece that came out this week that you have where it's so there's so much destruction. And I mm-hmm. know that destruction is part of the creative process, but this seems different to me. It doesn't seem like creative destruction. It seems like destruction almost purposely with no real, it seems like pointless destruction. It seems like misdirected creative energy. I'm like trying to do something or, or make something or anything. I mean, I don't understand, you know, the, one of the lines in your piece that really cracked me up was, and you're just a brilliant writer. I love reading oh, you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you're one of those writers where I'm like, why do I bother writing? Uh, oh, hush now. Hush. I had to look up four words. To be Whoa. Honest. Do you remember what they were? I do. Um, okay. <laughs> some, of them, some of them, I was like, what's that? Like twee? I had never heard that. I'd either oh, heard yeah. or I didn't know what it was. Twee is a hard word to use, too. It uh, is a hard word to yeah, use. It's like, yeah, you got to be careful. There are some words I think that should never be used, like jejun. Do you know that word? Oh, it's just a horrible word. It's and not even free, pretty. Free zone? Free, free, frizzon? Frizzon. Frizzon's actually a good word. It's it like, is a good word. It, it sounds like what it is. Like, ooh, yeah. right? Yeah. Onomatopoeia. Yeah. yeah. Um, and there was another one that I was really impressed with. It was the oh. last term you used. Uh, in Medea Race? 
Yeah, I just didn't okay. know how. how I, I, was like, you know, I would never know how to use this. <laughs> I don't know. A couple of years ago, you know, like you you've been writing for a long time. You have something of an education, and you realize like I don't know anything about Latin, and you're just like, and then you start reading stuff over and over, and you're like, oh, I get it, and you you can use it when it makes yeah. sense, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Those. I think those are the three that jumped out at me. There might have been one more, and then anyway, the quote was when you were talking about the kid. You said, we've tried for 20 years to do, you're quoting a kid, we've tried for yeah. 20 years to do it another way. It hasn't worked. Nothing changes except with violence, says the boy who is maybe 22. <laughs> then he flips me the bird. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So these two, these two were so, um, and in the reason piece, so I actually had them in one of the uh, the pieces in reason. They looked very, um, he looked like uh, the actor Benedict Cumberbatch. Like a trust like fund the, kid? That's, oh, no, no, no. They were complete readies from, re like, no, I mean, I don't know this for sure, but like, they were both quite tall and willowy and he looked like Benedict Cumberbatch, but of course they're covered in black and she was very, you know, sort of had like those, like that English rose complexion because I don't think she had her mask over her face. They were so unbelievably snotty like snotty of the kind of kids you knew in high school who were like you know it's interesting I knew some I, I went to a kind of ritzy private school in Brooklyn most everybody was kind of bohemian their parents whatever but there were definitely like the families that were like oh you know really super waspy mm -hmm. it's only later that you find out that like the mother and the family was a chronic alcoholic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You realize what a little dick you were for like, yeah. being mean to these people. But anyway, they were super, super snotty. And the thing about a lot of these kids in Portland, they, and I, I've written this, I mean, a godzillion times, they know how to break things. They don't yet know how to build things. Yeah. And I, you know, I just was uh, looking back because I'm, I'm doing some writing about in this whole arena. Shocking. Um, and I was looking back at the the head of, is it Coinbase or Bitcoin? I guess it's Coinbase. I can't remember his name. And he put out something to, uh, actually, I can find it. He put out something to his employees and said, look, we are not, we're, we're not, here to discuss politics every day. We're here actually to work. <laughs> and so where is it? Yes, the head of Coinbase. And he basically puts up a, 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 and he said, look, and if you don't want to be here because it's more important to you to figure out, you know, like, did something happen? And should we have some more equity and this and that? He's like, that's fine. You're totally allowed to do that. But we can't do that on work hours and we're not going to do it. And if you want, I will buy you out. Mm. I will buy your contract. And 60 people took it. Oh, wow. And and my whole thing about like, you know, my, my husband's business getting, you know, put out of business and all this and people that want to put other people's businesses out of business or they want somebody else's job. I'm like, OK, go build something. Right. I'm actually not not even being sarcastic or snotty. I'm I'm interested in seeing what they could build. Here's right. the problem. Here's the problem, though. So. If you are someone that knows how to break windows and start fires and sloganeer and throw buckets of diarrhea into the police station and, you know, accuse someone of doing X to you when X hasn't been done, that's your skill set, right? Mm. That's what you know how to do. So, okay, now let's say you, uh, in Portland, for instance, you do defund the police. You defund the police and maybe you get the mayor. You know, they ran him out of his house, the, the mayor. They, right. they, they protested so long in front of his house, he finally moved. So let's say you get your way. All these people that you say are keeping you down or keeping other people down. Okay. What have you built? Right. What can you build when your skill set is throwing buckets of diarrhea? Right. Like, what do you, 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 if you, if you play soccer all the time, you're going to be a good soccer player. You're, right. You're not going to be able to, you're not going to be able to sing at the Metropolitan Opera House. Right. So you, these Anybody that is, oh, we can go back to a recent story, and this, is, this isn't this is really exact, but I know you covered the Donald McNeil Jr. situation at the New York Times, and they, you know, the, the, the more activist staff in there, they complained about him. They didn't like that he'd used the N-word back in context two years ago. They wanted it re-examined, and this, blah, 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 and within eight days, he was gone. Right. And I was like, okay. I mean, he was really... He was very good at his job, including having, you know, covered AIDS in Africa and Zika and getting right. cancer drugs to people in South America. Like he actually was like a good person trying to do good thing. I'm, good person. That's a that's a judgment call. But he was a person trying to help other people in the world, like right. in life, actual life and death situations. Right. Okay, so he's gone. You, you're going to just step into his shoes. Is right. that how that is that how that works? You may want someone younger or of a different color. 
And that's fine because that is the way the world will turn. But there is no reason to unceremoniously get these people out of the building because what you know how to do is get people out of the building. Right. Why don't you go do a really, really amazing job as a journalist and have your work be so freaking good that the next time, you know, Dean Baquet is having a meeting, they're like, you know, Donald McNeil is 67. He's, you know, he's going to retire soon. And you know what? I think we got to really think about getting Bridget Phetasy in there because she has been proving herself to be an exemplary employee who's been fun to work with and has brought great, great things to the Times. That's how I want to see things happen. And that is not that is not what we're seeing. And that's unfortunate. And I am interested to see what happens to, let's say, the New York Times when their decision-making process is to get rid of people that the activist class uh, no longer wants around. Yeah. Nick had some thoughts on that. He thinks that it's thoughts? actually good. He basically thinks that oh, they'll... Nick. <laughs> I know my friends are like classic libertarian, like everyone can have their own bubble and their own media empire. And it's great. But that's basically he fe he feels like they'll keep becoming more and more extreme. They'll cater more and more to the people who are subscribing, because like all of us, he's on a subscriber model. They're on a subscriber model and the other people will go other places. And he actually thinks it's it's fine. You know, his well, I OK, so I I actually don't have a problem with that at all. I mean, if the if a place is going to put itself out of, okay, I'm not saying the New York Times is going to put itself out of, out of business, but I, I've said this before on other podcasts. You know, the Times was in was kind of in hot water financially right. before you know Trump came around, and then they had all these anger subscribers and blah 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 blah, and they were feeding the anger every day, more and more outrage, blah blah blah. We love it. Okay, so now I, it's kind of. I mean, you cannot like what Joe Biden is doing, but it's pretty hard to get up the same kind of head of steam that people right. got. At Trump because they're different personalities. All right. So let's say you have, oh, I'll be, I'll be conservative. Let's say you have 5% attrition of subscriber base. Cause you know, I don't really feel like paying for the New York times anymore uh, in paper or even digital form, because I don't feel that same need. I don't have that itch that I need scratched anymore. Well, you know what? 5% is a lot. And let's add to that, that maybe you're not going to be attracting the new readers because they're not, they don't really care as much about you. I, I, have, I have one friend that said, you know, I'd like to open the sports pages and kind of read what's going on with the Jets or the Giants or the Mets, as opposed to just like, you know, trans issues on soccer in high school in Ohio. It's right. like, I might want to know what's happening in my hometown here. Right. So at a certain point, sure. Go other places. But for me, maybe just as a New Yorker, or maybe I'm sentimental, or maybe because the Times still does some of those kick ass journalism around in terms of certain stories. I mean, they, I've read stories, two stories in the past month that brought me to my freaking knees. In term, one, was, one was reporting on people, like the deaths of old people with Alzheimer's within mm -hmm. nursing homes and yep. how they were trying to understand. I mean, the guy who they gave him a cut out of his wife so he could talk to her because she couldn't visit anymore. But then he started trying to feed her. I mean, yeah. I mean, Bridget, it was incredible. Yeah, they and still he, do amazing journalism. He still can. And, and okay, so, all right, I'm sure Nick is willing to lose that because someone else will do it. And of course, I'm, I'm actually fine with that. But in the meantime, watching the bloodshed is, you know, it's kind of, I feel like it's beneath the times. I really yeah. do. But I look at how most people who have the subscriber model, I, I see it with even friends online, the more controversy they have around their Twitter page or their site, it drives subscribers. So I, I remember realizing this a long time ago. So I got, I kicked the incel hornet nest once and <laughs> it was bad. Like never, never again. I, I don't know. I, I thought it was, a, there are certain fights that I was like, oh, that was really dumb of me and actually kind of dangerous because although I think most are pretty harmless there, it only takes really one. Yeah. Yeah. Harmless. And it was, it was horrible and i had to go off twitter and deactivate my account and there was a lot of stuff and you know one of the problems with when this happens is like that fbi and the freaking police will be like don't even talk about it yeah. um and or draw attention to it so but it dropped i mean i it drove so many subscribers to me because they saw what was happening 
And I was like, I understand why people do this. I understand why people say stupid things they probably don't even mean because they know that it will drive people to subscribe to them when they're a victim. But this is the culture that oh. I rage against. So Absolutely. as much I can't give into it as much as people are like, I didn't know that happened to you. I didn't know that this other thing happened to you. I didn't know you got dragged by this community. I'm like, because I don't draw attention to it because no. I, I can't make that my business model. It goes against everything that I believe and that I'm trying to like that whole dumb idea of being the change you want to see in the world. That is part of the problem, that kind of that kind of model. And it's so tempting. It's so it's, tempting. You know, so I when I uh, the whole thing that got my husband's business in trouble was a little uh, podcast I had with uh, Leah McSweeney, who's now on the Real Housewives of New York. And she's a dear friend and I love her. And we'd only done um, five episodes. And uh we were like, we were about the tech was shit. We were YouTubing. It was visual. I mean, it was just like awful, but it was fun. Like we were having fun and we were talking. We were trying to have some nuanced conversations about things. And um, we had had literally in after the third episode aired, I, I think we had a total of 5,000 views. Okay. Like, which is like nothing, right? Right. Well, the controversy hit and we we actually did wind up to get two more in the can and immediately we had over 50,000 views. Right. Okay. Right. Don't go looking for it anyone. It's not online. I scrubbed it because I was asked to do that. And so I did it. I didn't care. I would have left them up there. But uh, you don't want to wallow in that. Right. Like, I mean, can you imagine like, oh, I'm going to sit here in my sad, all these things that happened to me. And now everybody, oh, let's all have like this party around this terrible thing that happened to me. I'm not saying that horrible things don't happen to people. But if you have the opportunity and the option, which often you do, to move on to more sunshiny places with you know, interesting people doing interesting things. I think you should really do it. And if you get a little less fame because of that, well, that's okay. Yeah. Because you're going to be happy and you're going to be able to spread it to other people as opposed to being this font of misery, which, which, uh, 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 there's so many other places to, better places to congregate than around what, that. What do you attribute the, like you said, they know how to kind of throw poo. And what do you think? I think about this a lot because I can be very hard on millennials and Gen Z and I is part of it like the boomers hanging on to power for too long and not opening up those places for people to go into or because I hear this like, oh, it's because they're clinging to power for too long. And I'm like, yeah, but you could still do other things. <laughs> like, There's not I guess I'm trying to one of the questions I wanted to ask you what is your most charitable feeling about what is going on with these youngsters who really only know how to destroy? They're kids. Yeah. They're kids. But and, I didn't do um, that when I was a kid. No, but because there were other things going on. I mean, we are a part of our, you know, uh, whatever was happening in our generation, whether, you know, someone was like a hippie or they were no nukes or if they were, you know, I like super, super. I, no, I, I know. I know. I was, I was just like City. partying and smoking. Me too. Beer. I was just, a, I was just, yeah. I <laughs> but see, also, you and I might be similar this way. I have never in not, not one moment in my life have I been interested in having any sort of label at all. Like, yeah, <laughs> I think what two things, mother and writer. Those are the two things yeah, I'll take writer. because they're mine and I'm going to cop to them, you know, but people, people really do want to feel part of something. Maybe they don't really they feel afraid to be on themselves. And then, of course, we know and I've said that this is like if anyone else I'm pre apologizing to anyone here who has ever seen me on another podcast, because I have said this on almost every podcast I've been on. But when I was in the barrel with the whole Ristretto Roasters things, I got an email from with the what? The Ristretto Roasters, my husband's oh, okay, business yeah, uh, yeah. thing. And it, it was like nine days old and it was a mess. And I get an email from a woman named Heather Hying. And she says, hi, Nancy, you don't know me, but my name is Heather Hying. And I had this blah, blah, blah happen to my husband, Brett Weinstein, and I. And I, I read about what's going on with you. I live in Portland now, and I'd really like to extend my hand to you. Uh. And I'm like, hi, Heather. I do know who you are. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> we met for a coffee. And she said to me, and this is actually, I've said this because it has proven true 100% of the time. And it'll be good for your listeners to hear either as humans that are viewing or as friends, or if it happens to them, 
when these things happen, you have a few people that stand by you publicly. Yeah. You have a few more that stand by you privately and the vast majority sit on the fence and wait to see which way the wind blows. Right. So my, I have been, I mean, when these things happen to me, I had my, my solid, solid crew re- reach out to me immediately. And that would be, you know, Matt Welch and, and, and Barry Weiss and, and other friends of mine that I've known forever. And I make a point of doing this, even if I don't know someone very well to, yeah. to reach out my hand and say, it's okay. We're yep. you know, we're gonna be okay. Stay steady. Yeah, yeah. Um, I do the same thing. Of course, you have to. <laughs> yeah. Because it's it's a terrible, terrible feeling. You really feel like you're like drowning in fire. But people are afraid. They're afraid to not be part of the right side. They're afraid that someone else's shame or perceived shame is going to splash onto them. They're just afraid in general. And um, and then they feel they feel powerful in a group. I've I've written this before, you know. One on one, these you know, I was out at as your your listeners can know, I was out at the Portland protest a lot. Some of them the more peaceful ones, and some of them the definitely very not peaceful ones. And I got tear gassed um, more than once. One night, really badly, and you know, who washed up my eyes? It was one of these black block girls. Mm-hmm. You know, little girl, like she probably weighed a hundred pounds, soaking wet. She washed out my eyes for me. And then a couple of, that was in um, July. And mm. then I think sometime in early September, it was a daytime rally. And there were a lot of, um, it was, there was like back the blue. And I think some uh, Patriot prayer guys, I don't think there were any proud boys there. There, there may have been, but I didn't see them. Um, and I got gassed again and it was a Patriot prayer dude that yeah. washed out my eyes. Okay. So one-on-one, really these people are people and they're like, right you know what, they're chill and you can talk to them and probably want to have a roast beef sandwich with them and everything. But in groups, it you get this sort of, um, this feeling of power and people act incredibly badly. And I had a little theory about this. Okay, so go back to your original question. You know, what is it generationally, right? So why, I mean, we've always, you know, in war, people have their outfits. I wear blue, you wear red. I know who my enemy is, right? Well, we see now with the 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 Antifa and Black Bloc, they're completely covered. And and this is also not unusual. Like you cover your face so you're not recognized, right? I think it's a lot like how the younger generations have grown up with the ability to be anonymous online. Mm. And when you can be anonymous online, you can say um the most terrible things if you want to. I first of all, I wouldn't do it I wouldn't do it anonymously and I wouldn't do it Personally, it just is not of interest to me to say terrible things about other people online. Um, but they have, and that's how they've grown up. Maybe they've been hurt by it. Um, it's very normal. And so now they're just taking it to the streets yeah. a little bit, right? It's the same sort of they can they can do things to you or throw. I mean, do you think that if they were unmasked and their grandmother was nearby, they would be throwing a bucket of diarrhea at the police? Probably not. Yeah. You know? It's something that I interviewed. I think is I'm blanking on his name. He wrote kind of the book on online behavior early. And I believe it's called the online disinhibition theory. And it's this That's, concept sounds right. of why people behave so badly online or differently than they would in real life. And I asked him, do you think that this, this was years ago. I asked him if he thought it was going to start, you know, kind of boomeranging out into the real world. Right. And, I've been seeing it more and more and more and way more where people, my sister the other day called me and she said, I saw a real life Facebook fight in a restaurant the other day. Oh, I you think know, I, was, oh, it was a restaurant. No, it was like at some like bed, bath and beyond or no, something. She was out at a restaurant and she witnessed it. And she said, this was, it was a, an actual, and then someone else two days later texted me and said, I just saw a Twitter fight in the grocery store. So it's like people are starting to behave in real life the way they are online. And I don't think that being only online for a year has helped that process. You know, I think. It's- well, maybe it's maybe it's like, you know, uh, uh, like you just always need a bigger. It's like a, like it, like you can get like a starter vibrator and it works for a while. Then you need to move on to a bigger <laughs> vibrator. Right. So yeah. you have to take it to the streets. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, probably there is that aspect of it because they were saying I read this really brilliant article and I really love to revisit it if I could ever find it. And it was all about how all of the couch activism and faux outrage. And this was before this past year 
was rewiring our brains because originally outrage was meant to instigate action. And it was all of this online outrage that we were seeing with no action. And so maybe it didn't rewire our brains. Maybe our brains were like, we need to move (laughs) and go be active. (laughs) I'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor. We're all trying to get in shape and eat right. Many of us are trying to lose those quarantine pounds. And Freshly can help. Their delicious meals are designed by nutritionists and cooked by chefs, making it easier to eat better. And honestly, they have such good food. It's so rare and exciting to find food that is not only easy to throw in the microwave, but also is really good for you. And it makes it super fast and no excuses because a lot of people will make excuses about why they can't food prep and why they can't do this and that. And Freshly takes all of that thinking and all of those excuses away. For instance, I had the steak peppercorn with sauteed carrots and fresh green beans, and it was delicious. And the other one I loved, which was surprisingly delicious, was beef bolognese with cauliflower shells. I didn't even notice that they were cauliflower shells. They tasted so good. Ordering is easy. Visit Freshly.com and choose from over 30 delicious, satisfying, better-for-you meals like steak peppercorn, as I mentioned, one of my favorites, sausage baked penne, or their chicken pesto bowl. It can... Fit into your lifestyle with a variety of plans and meals to pick from that work for your dietary needs, preferences, tastes, and family size. Right now, Freshly is offering our listeners $40 off your first two orders when you go to Freshly.com slash walk-in. Stop stressing about dinner. Go to Freshly.com slash walk-in for $40 off your first two orders. That's Freshly.com slash walk-in for $40 off your first two orders. You know, it's interesting. I remember being like, this is when I was a kid, like in grade school, and it might have been on like an IQ test or something. I don't know. There were two pictures, drawings. They might have been photos, actually. And there was one like super red faced man, like screaming, ah! And then there was one guy, very still, but with a stern, sort of like a Timothy McVeigh looking kind of character. (laughs) And it said, which of these two characters is more dangerous? Mm. And it was the the guy on the I, right, I, yeah, the, the Timothy and, right, yeah. And I I kind of knew that as a kid. It's like if someone's like spouting and screaming, they're they're actually not really the danger to you. The person that's plotting is the dangerous person. And when I was in Portland, so I started reporting. You know, the, the, the protests got more and more violent and they're mm-hmm. still going on. And I call them, I get a lot of crap for calling them like protesters. I'm like, okay, guys, here's what we can do. We can call them protesters. We can call them demonstrators. We can call them rioters. It doesn't matter what I call them. Someone's going to be unhappy with my characterization right. of them, right? So, okay, let's call them whatever you want to call them. But I, I, I had been reading a, a book about the Bader Meinhof gang in Germany, uh, how we're like so disappointed in their parents for being Nazis, so they were going to write the world by like blowing people up, you know? Because yeah, because mm-hmm. this is all how this works, right? And I was like, how long before we see bombs in basements in Portland, right? Because the police are not stopping it, right? The police were they? It, it's too long a story. I'm sure your readers, your, your viewers know something about it. But the the DA that came in last July basically made most crimes in Portland no longer criminal, right? right. So you, anything you were doing in the course of protesting was you, you were not going to be arrested for unless it was like really met some sort of high bar. So people keep getting away with it. But is that satisfying, right? You kind of maybe sometimes you want a little bit of a response. You want the action. You want the pushback and you want the tension. And then all of a sudden we start seeing IEDs, right? We start seeing Molotov cocktails getting thrown at federal forces. Not really a really good idea, right. you know? Um, and he, that person did get arrested. So uh, yeah, where, where do they go with this? How is it satisfiable? Mm. Is it satisfying? Even when you overthrow, even when you've got a Do- Donald McNeil out of the New York Times, even when you get $15 million taken away from the Portland police or you set a police conference, are you satisfied? No. Has that been a, a good enough orgasm? No, it hasn't been. You need to do it again because what's happening here, it is a, it's an addiction. It's a yeah. hunger. It's a hunger and you need to keep feeding it and you don't, you can't, you need more and more, you know, 
just as calories or whatever it is you want to call it. So we are, you know, the conversation we, you know, it's it's one conversation we we all keep having. People that sort of are trying to write about this stuff in a in a in a broad way. It's like someone asked the other day in a clubhouse, "Where do you think you are? Where are we on the spectrum? Are we are it at the beginning? Are we in the middle or at the at the end? Because this will pass. This too shall pass. Of course. And I thought, I thought we're a little past the middle, but I, I got some pushback on that. What do you What do you think? That's a good question. And I'm kind of bored with the conversation too. I know, I know. Most of us who are in this space have been having it for a long time. Yep. Um, but I'm interested in your perspective on the because you've been on the ground with a lot of these younger kids. I mm-hmm. think you are. Your perspective is really valuable, and because you come from a a more compassionate kind of nuanced place. Like you said, I think they're kids. And Jaron, my husband read your piece and he said when halfway and through it, he was like, this is just meaning making, you know, he's like, they've just found meaning in this and identity and purpose. Yes. And that's dangerous, (laughs) you know, that because it's like you said, you have to keep feeding that Mm -hmm. meaning and he's like I just want to go hug them all because they couldn't make like beer or whatever (laughs) you know they didn't oh I love I I love your husband and here's the thing they can and I will tell you uh so I have a young adult daughter and she was raised in Portland but she's living lived in New York for 10 years and we were back there she was with me when I was reporting she was hanging out with friends last summer and one of her very dear friends who I love who was kind of a who lived with us for a while when she was in high school. And I know her very well. And, um, you know, she's she's pretty much of a Portland girl, not 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 violent at all, but definitely would like go out and kind of like march and that kind of stuff. And, um, I, you know, they definitely had friends that were out there fucking shit up her yeah. and her, her fiance. I don't think they were, but they were they were adjacent. adjacent right. Right. And he worked at a bar and so did she. And, um, you know, Portland, just like every other city, has had their vicissitudes like open, close, open, closed. And so finally, the, this one guy's bar uh, was going to open, which was great. And he was pulling out one of the outdoor tables. And the here comes the squad, you know, the people that are marching downtown to fuck shit up. And they grab his table and they throw it. And he's like, guys, you know, and they're like, if you. Basically, I'm misquoting, but it's like, if you're not with us, you're against us. Right. Okay. And so this girl and her fiance said, you know what we did after that at night? We went home and played Catan. Right. And I called them the, I think I put them in one of my pieces, the reluctant revolutionaries, right? Yeah. Because at first it's all kind of like fun and it's out there. We can't do anything else. It's COVID. We had our jobs, our schools are closed. What are we going to do? We're out here. Yay. We're saving the world. We're making it better. And then it's like, yeah. Nah. And also, oh my God, Bridget, when are they going to get bored of doing the same thing every night? It's like, that's why I agree with your husband. It's like, I want to go up to them and say, guys, it's such a big world out there. Like really 200 nights in a row of breaking windows and setting fires. You can't be getting off on this anymore. Right. (laughs) It's just, you know, (laughs) yeah, it's, 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 uh, does it just like wear itself out? You know, it's, it's like a, in some ways I understand the instinct to kind of not push back because in some ways that's, I feel like what they're asking for. It's like a child tantruming yep. when you just like oh, let yeah. them tantrum until they fall sure. asleep. That's right. Um, <laughs> My friend Ben says the woke go to sleep eventually. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so do you just let it kind of burn itself out or does it get well, more steam? I mean, we had protests that there were Brianna Taylor protests the other night and then inevitably black block comes along. They turn into riots. A bunch yeah. of businesses got smashed. It's like, why, why, how are you long? Are you going to do yeah. this until every part of the city is boarded up? I, well, I we, we have something interesting that's happened in Portland since, um, 
Well, it kind of actually started after Biden was elected. So the last piece on the ground I wrote for Portland, I've written a couple of other Portland pieces for Reason. And if people are interested, they go over to Reason.com and type in my name and they'll, all the pieces will pop up. Portland was so blue and so anti-Donald Trump that everything was Donald Trump's fault all the time. And mm -hmm. then, you know, people were saying to me, Nancy, Nancy, what happens if he's reelected? I was like, well, it'll be a little more gas in the activist's tank, but I don't know how much will change if it'll really ramp up. Oh, but they'll be happy if Biden Biden is elected. I'm like, boy, you are oh, so were. high. You have yeah. no idea you what's were, going on. You here. were saying this forever before yeah, Biden got elected. I said they they live in a post political world. They yep. want what they want, and what yep. it is they want, maybe they can't even articulate it. Anyway, the day after the election, it was a very very bad riot. Lots of breaking of stuff. I covered it. I was there. I was wading through broken glass, and uh, the governor the night before she'd actually called out. And she was quite anti Trump. She'd called out on um, the National Guard, which I think they'd only done. Tw that was only the second time, if not the first. And she said, for the first time, we will not stand for violence from left, right, or center. Because right. previously, it was only blaming right-wing groups, which right. is, which was disingenuous, but the people can read my article and that they can see how I put that in context. But um, in any case, since that's happened, the riots have not stopped. And then we had the, little, the red school the red house situation. We're now like an autonomous zone. And then we had the new year's day stuff. And then we had the January 20th stuff and the mayor who's been about as, you know, about as effective as an old soggy cornflake um, kind of it has just come out and said, first, he was like, I don't understand why the fuck you're still doing this now. He is coming out and being pretty strong about it, including asking for $2 million for the police. I mean, right. It, this is insane. It's so here's here's the deal. Parody. Here's the deal. There have to be consequences. There have to be. Okay, because Bridget, if you and I walk in downtown Portland, just you and I, two gals walking around, and we smash in the window of Starbucks, <laughs> we're getting arrested. I know. But okay? if we put on a black mask and like <laughs> we're fine. That's right. We are not, we are not going to be held accountable. Well, let me ask you something. You're 20 years old and you've been doing this every night. You're bored as fuck, but you're doing it anyway. And you're arrested. I mean, what's happening now is you're arrested, but it, you get right out. And there's all these bail funds set up because you know we're fighting the good fight. We're gonna we're gonna support these kids. Oh, but anyway, <laughs> I think arresting people for crimes is a start. I think people are not gonna want to stay in jail when you're 22 years old and maybe you go to read college and uh, you could maybe not be sitting in jail. Maybe well, you won't do it again. Or it goes the other way or they get like super more organized about it and go underground and say, OK, right. well, we're going to wage this war with real guns. Right. Well, that's what's interesting, too. I was reading something the other day and my my feed that I generally look at is, you know, pretty left, right and center. And very, I get to see the very vast and two Americas that we live in. And it was at least two. <laughs> At least. And it was a bunch of left wing writers talking about how the there weren't that many prosecutions for the Capitol riots and most of them got let out and they were they didn't even they let them walk away. And I was laughing. I'm like, nobody's getting charged with anything for any kind of rioting in America right now. Like, doesn't matter right. what side you're on. <laughs> Yeah, but they want to see it their way. Yeah. Yeah, but it's yeah. funny because yeah. you'll hear the right being like, no one's getting, I'm like, from my perspective here in the middle, like you can pretty much do whatever the fuck you want right now. And you'll probably get away with it if you're rioting for a side. For a cause, <laughs> yeah. right? You're, 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 you're breaking windows for a cause. It's like, right. really, like, I really would like to say how, how, when you go to Wild Fang, and Wild Fang is like this, you know, genderless, super, super lefty progressive company, I have actually stood there and said, how is this, I, I, I'm being uh, genuine here, how do you feel that this has helped the cause? Mm. Photography equals death! It's like, wait, what? No, wait, what? And they're like, I've literally, oh, you're just too old, you wouldn't understand. Oh, Okay. So there actually is a, there's something here. Breaking a window equals better rights for, for, for black people. Right. I, I, please, please show me because that, that is not, you're not doing that. You're doing, you have, it is truly almost the work of toddlers. Toddlers, you know, you give them when they're little, you give them these little like plastic hammers and right. things, put things and they move things around, they break it and they put it back together. I have not. And again, I could be wrong, Bridget. There could be all kinds of like interesting stuff being built in Portland that I just have not heard about mm -hmm. um, by the activists. 
But I don't think so. And I will also tell you that, you know, the more I, I wrote or t- uh, tweeted about this this morning, the more activist contingent, two of them got, vo- well, one got voted out, uh, Chloe Udaly. She's gone. And then this Joanne Hardesty, who's been really the one who's been stumping to defund the police, who's also the one that called uh, 911 when her uh, Lyft driver oh, uh, I read about was, that. was, she didn't think he was being nice enough to her. So she wanted the cops to come for that though, right? But yeah. you should defund, you should defund the, the, the violent crime unit. She is, she, she's not gaining ground. And they also, they also elected someone who's supported by the police commission. And I think Portland realizes as much as they, as anti-Trump as they were, we are in a post-Trump age right now. And you have a basically a middle class, uh, a middle class in Portland. Yes, predominantly white. Portland always has been, but but not exclusively. I think it's really changed now. I think it's like 73% white as opposed to 96. (laughs) Um, And it's like people really want their kids to go to school. They want to be able to kayak on the weekends. They want to go back to the breweries because Portland does do Portland does food and drink really well. Portland's Portland's beautiful. It's a small town, a little too small for me, always was, but it's a it's a beautiful little city that has good like public transportation and it's got a lot of parks. Yeah. And people want to not have 200 to 600 yahoos running the show. It's well, it's, it's not fair. Yeah, and that's what that's the thing. I have a lot of friends in Portland because I worked in Southern mm. Oregon and I talk to them pretty regularly and they don't really what I try to explain to people is that this is happening in a pretty small area and most yep. of my friends who live there I know about it before them. They're just not aware of it. They don't they're not exposed to it. They're not on that side of town. They don't go there. They kind of live in their own little world or so they're they're like, oh, yeah, that's just like six blocks that these kids go crazy. And so there is a part of like, I think because it's a lot of Gen X or who are there is that like, whatever, let the kids like burn down six blocks. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Unfortunately, unfortunately, those six blocks are downtown. Right. And downtown Portland is not downtown New York where it's, you know, 800 blocks. It's, you know, I don't know, 60 square blocks total. And um, downtown looks like it's closed. Yeah, it's closed. And yeah. um, there's there's wires around everything and it's yeah. dirty. And I, I think that's true. You know, a lot of people said to me, oh, my God, I can't go to Portland. It's like, guys, look, it doesn't look like this everywhere. Right. But increasingly, it is in different pockets, including and I've, I've written ad nauseum about this, including and I don't know if they're still doing this. So I should not I should not speak about it. But, you know, the people marching through the streets and waking up residents at night mm. with shy, shy, shining lights in their window, because as one of them told me, you're living your comfortable life and other people are uncomfortable and we want you to be uncomfortable. Right. It's like everybody <laughs> has to be this idea of theirs. Now, you you know, most of these kids are white and are not living uncomfortably. No. But they they feel that they are, you know, fighting. I, I And you know what? They may well believe it. They may right. well believe in their cause, but um, the way they're going about it is, um, I mean, we've seen it before. We've seen it throughout history, right? Or in the past 300 years. Um, And, you know, if you got your way, okay, then you're 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 setting yourself up to be the next person that the next generation does it to you. Well, right. right. That's the problem with this is that every (laughs) person who, I mean, you're seeing this right now with Teen Vogue. They they became victims of their own ideology that they've been pushing. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing about this ideology that I find so um, it, it, Michael Malice and I were talking about this when I was on his podcast because he's from he's Soviet Union and he's Russian and he's like it's so this idea of like victimhood perpetually is he's like I'm so viscerally repelled by it and I have the same kind of reaction to it of okay and I ask women in my life who are like, well, we're victims of the pain. I'm like, where? Okay. Say this is all true. Say, say, assume that all of this is true. Assume everything that you're saying is true. We live in a, by the way, I reject a lot, all these premises. We live in a systemically racist society. We are all under the heel of the patriarchy. Capitalism is only for rich people. I, I assume all of this is true. What are you going to do with your life? You still have to. Okay. Like, so what? I I don't understand where you play that tape forward and that does you any good. You so I remember being 19 years old and being in rehab 
and having fucked up my entire life. And I had come from a really fucked up family and it didn't matter. There was a moment in rehab when I was like, okay, well, some of this wasn't my fault and I still have to build a life. When I was a kid, like a little kid, uh, like five, four or five, I threw tantrums. Uh, my father had a, who died last year, has a, a, a super eight of me throwing a tantrum. And it's hilarious because I'm literally like pulling up the grass and crying. It's, there's no sound, but. Um, my best friend is like this. Yeah. And then at, like the next shot, it's me laughing. Okay, fine. Mm -hmm. um, but I remember being very, very young and like kind of wanting bids for attention. Now you're very young, right? And so like, how do you get a bid for attention? Oh, my leg hurts. Oh, I have a stomach ache. Oh, I, I don't know. I missed my ride. I don't know. Like these, these little things that you make up and they get you attention because, because look, if I, I, if someone says to me, if you came up to me and say, I broke my arm, I'd be like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Let me help you. Let me make you, you know, a grilled cheese sandwich or <laughs> bandage your arm for you. Um, and that gets you the attention you want. Well, if something really bad happens to you, and I know bad things have happened to you, and you know there have been some not great things that have happened to me, um, and you know maybe certainly someone I I mean I have I have like you know I've told my husband about certain things, and that, because that's the person I needed to mm -hmm. confide in and talk about it. But to carry that around in the world and then, you know, sh make sure, keep it fresh, keep it shiny, <laughs> or, or keep that scab open. Oh, shit, yeah. the scab's closing up. Hold on. Now that the door's closed, let me scratch that sc scab off so yep. that it stays nice and fresh so that I can make sure that people will continue to respond to this open sore of mine, but privately and quietly, I'm going to keep it open. Well, yep. I find this to be truly sad and without imagination. I find it, I find it the opposite of courageous because it's a big world and there's many, many more things to do. And I find it manipulative. Yeah. And I also don't want to blame anybody for my problems. Now, again, okay, let's back up. I have enough money. I'm middle class. I'm not sick. I'm white. I'm attractive. So I have some advantages that, that other people don't. That is for sure. But there's plenty of people with fewer advantages than me that have done a whole lot fucking better than me. So how'd that happen? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> how'd that happen? Yeah. I, I, I just don't necessarily think that the disconcerting attitude of bringing everybody down instead of lifting each other up is crabs in a barrel. Yeah, it's not good. That that's that's like our whole society. And I was thinking about this the other day. It It's so natural. You see this naturally happening in groups anyway. But to see it kind of on the societal level is that's where I'm not sure. You know, I, wor I worry about the young people a lot. I worry about the young men because I've heard from so many of them. I really worry about the young women because I feel like they're being fed this bullshit that they're powerless victims. Like, it's a weird paradox to be growing up as a young woman. And I can't imagine with the media that they ingest, the constant being online and then you're being told that you're under the boot of the patriarchy and this is a patriarchal system of oppression while Cardi B is dancing at the Grammys. Like that paradox is how do you even make sense of that cognitive dissonance if you're a young woman? That messaging uh, is so crazy to me. I, you know, I have a child who's a young adult and, uh, you know... <laughs> funny i'll like say to her oh my her name's tava i'm like oh my god tava i'll read her the latest thing like whether it's like a a teen vogue or she was the one that sent me the whole thing about dr seuss the other day and i'll be like oh she's like mom i can only apologize for my generation so much <laughs> <laughs> i can say that definitely she and her friends do not buy into this uh at all they do not buy into their not being able to do things because of you know the patriarchy or any of this shit they yeah. they are going out and they are conquering the world as they as they see fit but i want to get back to something you said about the whole thing that happened with my husband's business it was like started by one gal who had like been with the company for for a long long time and then she started this thing and she got like a lot of you know sunshine for being you know this warrior against whatever the patriarch whatever it was that they were they felt that they were conquering right mm -hmm. so all right so now bridget you're an employer and now this woman comes to you for a job and uh 
And you say, well, where was your last employment? <laughs> and you say, oh, it was here where I, you know, took my anger and everything to the media and made sure to really super smear my boss. Yeah. You're going to yeah. hire this person? So these people that are spending their time bringing other people down, there may very well be companies being built now that value that, that right. are like, these are the people we want. We want the activists. We want, you know, the 60 people that left Coinbase. We want right. people that come to work and spend 50% of their time, you know, doing the work and 50% of their time fighting for civil rights and fighting for justice as we see fit. And that's fine. They absolutely and 100% can run these businesses. I will say when you've got to make a bottom line and you now know that you're only going to get 50% of your workers time because you've dedicated the other 50% towards social justice missions, which might wind up tearing everybody apart, you know, let's see if you can make it work. Uh, it'll be interesting to see. It will be very, very, very interesting to me to see what people that are very, very committed to these sorts of campaigns, what they build. I, I mean, yeah, I'm wondering what kind of self-segregation is happening in the workforce right now because, or just segregation in general, because I'm sure there are people who won't hire people who don't have pronouns in their bio, for example, you get, and maybe it's not open. I'm sure that's true. I'm sure but that's true. I won't let that shit in the door. So I no. think it goes both ways. Absolutely. Know? No, like, but you see, you're absolutely right. It does go both so ways. I'm wondering and like how much, how much that's happening where it's like, you're looking through resumes and you're like, ah, Latinx, put that, out. you know, like, nope. A uh, woman with an X and, out on the... Whoop. And isn't that sad? Isn't it sad yeah. that that we... Okay, so let's let's take Latinx, for instance, okay? Which, you know, we all heard about... Oh, I remember, God, it was like, uh, I guess about a year ago, 14 months ago, someone said BIPOC. And I was like, what is that? They said, don't worry, you'll have heard it 20 times two days from now. And I had... <laughs> and I had to tell my daughter, my daughter, who's half Native American, like mm. her dad was full blood, had never heard of it. She's like, ah, whatever. You know, but people like these labels. But let's say, let's just take Latinx, for instance, okay? I... Yeah, didn't wouldn't seem particularly important to me, but let's say it is important to somebody to to have this differentiation. Okay, okay, fine. yeah. But when you weaponize it, when you say, and if you don't use it, then you're racist. It's like, no. Why is it that my word is bad? Like I was cool with your word, but you, but my word is bad. You can't. I think you can't have it both ways. I think you have to be. If you want people to be curious about the new roads that you're building, then you have to say, "I will be curious," and you know, let's be, let's accommodate each other here. You know, or not even. Yeah, it's. It's like, I don't care. That's the problem. I don't care if you have pronouns in your bio, but when you turn around and you start telling anyone who doesn't, uh, calling them a bigot, um, now I have a problem because now <sighs> you've taken this thing and you've weaponized it. And so, and then I worry because you'll see this stuff and I'm not saying that I would make decisions as an employer based on any kind of discrimination, but I, I worry because I'm like, oh, is this person going to cancel me? You know, you, th it's like you see that stuff and it signals like, oh, this might be a troublemaker. <laughs> you and know, you know, in, it, in your it, business. It, it could be for, I mean, uh, you know, the ones we hear about are the people that are becoming troublesome about you not using Latinx. But there could be, I mean, I, I don't think so because they've done, they've done sort of, you know, studies about this and showed that not like 3% of people are using Latinx and most people are like, yeah, whatever. But let's say people, somebody was like super sweet girl and she just preferred it. That's great. I yeah. don't care. I mean, whatever. But, yeah. but it's when you, people are deliberately turning these. And I think I used this in an article recently when they're turning these things into little, little um, pellets of kryptonite right? So that they can, they're, they're, they're storing them up to use against you. Maybe this one will work. Well, this one didn't work. Well, maybe, no, maybe this one will work, you know? And that's, that's just a rotten way to live. It's a rotten way to say that, you know, whatever identitarianism you feel is important to you, that's fine. That's great. Do it. But to make it, so you're doing it in order to fight me. I, I, I'm not here to fight you. Like that's not, and, and I also don't see that as progress. Yeah, I, I don't. And then so. say that it's something that they just want and it's like she, her or he, him. I don't care. Again, I don't care. But what 
worries me is if people are feeling pressured to put that because they're worried they won't get a job if they don't put it because there's so much pressure to put these things in your bio. Again, I'm I question like, okay, well, if the mob does come for us for something we said, you're probably not going to be the person that's standing standing with me. <laughs> I really so. I think I think it would be curious to know, uh, and I'm sure people have uh, done this. I really think most people don't care about this. Yes, it's definitely you know more prevalent in media and academia, but I think a vast majority of the country might not even know what we're I, talking about. I don't know because from I, yeah, you know, you have a lot of you. You and I talked about this. You got a ton of people that are not like you know. I'm I'm media. I'm New York City. I'm like the terrible person. I'm here. not in the bubble. I hear from right. mostly like corporate. Many of my followers, most of my audience, I would say is quote unquote flyover country, which I yeah. love. Yeah, and. I also think they work in corporations. They work at schools. I have a lot of tea. And so I'm hearing about the trainings that they have to go to constantly. And I mean, constantly. And they can't talk about it. They're not going to push back. They're not that I get emails constantly. I mean, Barry is doing a great job of reporting on this stuff. She is that she's free. And I'm glad because this is something that is not it is definitely going mainstream. You know, I, I, I think that people are afraid to say anything because they obviously don't want to lose their job. And even when people talk about it in my community, they talk about it anonymously. They're not putting their name out there or anything like that. So, or, or like their husband's training that he had to go to. It's, I, there's, there are a lot of these trainings happening all the time. I appreciate what Barry is doing and what other people are doing in terms of, you know, covering this stuff. You know, she and, and Caitlin Flanagan and the whole private school thing that they were yeah. writing about last week. I have, um, if you're readers, or readers, why do I keep saying readers? If you're listeners, well, I've got a Substack. Um, it's Nancy Rommelman. Oh, yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, nancyrommelman.substack.com. But the name of it is Make More Pie. And the reason is Make More Pie is not just because I'm a baking fool. I bake all the time. There are and a if lot you, of if, bakers in my community. Oh, if you if you become a premier subscriber, I actually um I actually will send you baked goods four times a year. But oh. but I, I post every I post everything for free. But if you go subscribe, that'll be great. You can you can go for you don't have to pay anything. But if you want to, that'd be great too. And one thing I am actually going to do, I think, with this, because right now I send out things twice a week. It's just like miscellaneous stuff, kind of fun videos, different things. But I think. When I hit the road, I might maybe go do some reporting from Minneapolis mm -hmm. and then also Portland. Um, mm -hmm. Then I will put be putting some uh, content up there, and then you can you can check in there. And then if you want to hit that tip jar, that'll that'll help me with my travels. But um, one thing I want to do, as opposed to just you know sort of quote unquote fighting this stuff head on, because I I don't want to be part of any team really, is I want to create new beauty. Right. Yeah. I want to create new stuff over here on the side. That's what I'm doing with Paloma Media. That's what you're doing. And just give people something shiny to look at over here. And then, you know, the other stuff just sort of cools down because yeah. I just don't, I'm just, I, it's not even that I'm tired of fighting it. It's just like, that's not what I want to do. No, I want to write, write good stuff bake good pie, have some cocktails, have friends over and write good stuff and, and commune with people online. And I, and I don't, I'm just not, you know, sometimes I get a little hot, hot under the collar. I can, especially like with Jesse Siegel, what's happening this week, you know, Jesse single, um, you know, it's really bullshit. And I will get in there and I'll, I'll put up a few fisty cuffs or something. Uh, you should go, uh, Matt Welch sang a little song in my apartment today about Jesse just being goofy, but you know, um, the way for, I think, is to make more pie as opposed to just like fighting over this this one pie over here. Let's just make another pie. Yeah, I I feel uh, the same way. I never wanted any of this. That's the opening line <laughs> of the book I'm writing. And I just I think that you were already a journalist. But again, you've been kind of I like I didn't want to be dragged into the middle of the culture wars. But then it was Heather yeah. Hying who said to me when I was like, I don't want any of this. I think I'm going to stop. And she's like, well, isn't that selfish? Like very gently. <gasps> oh, but it, Heather. <laughs> but it was, she was like, well, isn't, <laughs> wouldn't that be selfish of you in a very gentle yeah, and loving, in loving way. way? But, but, but firm too. She's, she's, she's because a badass. She, she is right. I am in a position right? where I can say something and there, and from what I'm hearing from all the people who email me, they can't. And yeah, yeah that's right. That's right. Hasn't gone mainstream. 
these conversations help people when it, when they experience it or they're suddenly trying to play catch up. And I have to remember that. I have to remember that even though I live and breathe this stuff, somebody might find this podcast between you and I after they have been called out of a Facebook mommy group because they said something wrong and not really fully understand what's going on and find some kind of relief in knowing that they're not alone that there are resources, that there's people out there who have been through this, that there, you know, I, I, that there's a whole community of people who are pushing back that they might not have even been aware of. And so I try to, you know, Glenn Beck gave me great advice when I was, when I went and did his podcast, he said, all the emails you get from people thanking you, because the one thing I hear over and over again is thank you. I don't feel alone and I don't feel crazy because I think when you are in this weird state, which we're in in America, where no matter what tribe you might have identified with, if if in the hyper polarization, if you're not part of the part of the process of the polarization and you're getting bounced back more into the classical liberalism from either side it can be disorienting. You know, there's there's this kind of disorienting feeling of being lost when you're like, what happened to my, you know, what happened to the country or the party or whatever I thought was, was were the values that we shared as Americans, freedom of speech, all these. And so I think it, I he said to basically print those emails or screenshot them and save them in a folder and then on days when I was like, why am I doing this? I want to quit to read them and remember that it's not about me. <laughs> I actually, you know, you forget, like, I don't think of myself as some big person or anything like that at all. And then you yeah, get you get the, the DMs because I keep my DMs open because of journalism um, or you get an email because they find me through my website. But especially, weirdly, on Facebook, which I'm not really on very often at all. But that's where people do congregate. I got, I've gotten after the whole thing with my husband's business. I got hundreds and hundreds of of messages there, saying, you know, thank you for saying the things that I haven't felt that I could say. Yeah. Um. Or th- or 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 now more directly on Twitter because I'm you know a Twitter addict like we all like, are. Uh, <laughs> I, mean, I honestly I, I should have named this podcast. All of my friends are Twitter addicts. <laughs> that's right. Well, that, well I'm here. I, yeah. Let's, uh, um, but uh, I I I do get. I will get those messages saying because I you know for me and I think for you too it mm-hmm. is it would be way harder not to speak up for me like I, I, I don't have a trouble I, I my next tattoo should be never shutting up like I just can't it's like I I don't understand how people don't speak up about this stuff <laughs> and like but and I try to craft it well I don't just like blather it out there and the people say please please keep talking and yeah. I'm like you don't have to worry baby cuz i will i will keep to- i will keep talking and so you you're absolutely right like you know we're not all the same like i can't play basketball but i like to watch other people play basketball yeah. right so um i they can go do that and i'll keep doing what i do and you know it's not my job to make people happy it's try my job to do my best and you know i'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor getting a good night's sleep can be hard to come by We're over-caffeinated, addicted to our screens, and living in an over-stimulating world, to say the least. When you run on too little sleep, it can take a serious toll on your mental and physical health. That's why we're excited to partner with Calm, the mental fitness app designed to help you relieve anxiety and improve your sleep. And if you go to calm.com slash walk-in, you'll get a limited time offer of 40% off a Calm Premium subscription, which includes hundreds of hours of programming. I listen to the sleep stories in the day (laughs) because I love how soothing they are. So sometimes if I'm just feeling spazzy and like I'm moving too fast and I need to slow down and I don't feel like sitting there and trying to meditate, I feel like these sleep stories... You don't have to just use them at night. They're awesome. And I often fall asleep listening to them and I want to actually hear them. For instance, my obsession this week is the glass maker of Murano. And it's a journey through time to Renaissance Venice. And you discover the secrets of ancient artisans. But I love it because it's so soothing talking about the whole process of glass making. This is what I do now. It's my dirty secret. 
I listen to sleep stories in the middle of the day. For listeners of the show, Calm is offering a special limited time promotion of 40% off a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash walk-in. That's 40% off unlimited access to Calm's entire library and new content is added every week. Get started today at calm.com slash walk-in. That's calm.com slash walk-in. So before we wrap up, I do want to ask you selfishly because I am not as disciplined as you and also just my community is a lot of writers. What is your writing process? Well, I I don't like really have one. I I tend to get up in the morning and um, make a cup of coffee and sit down and start kind of reading articles like who's been up before me, uh, what's been posted here. And then like weirdly, I start like how my brain starts going and I start, you know, doing a tweet thread. I will have assignments like right now I'm a little behind on on assignments, but they always get done sometimes in a tear, sometimes I'm really super slow. I'm starting a big, long feature for someone, a new publication I've never written for. I'm going to have to let them know, like, dude, I'm slow. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But that's because I have to really think about what I'm, you know, what did Joan Didion say? I have to write in order to see what I think. So that that's kind of how I work. Sometimes I like to write in the morning, but now it's weird. I've always lived um, with a family and kids and people in another house. Our house was always the place where there were a million people and I was always cooking for people. And now I'm living by myself in an apartment. So um, sometimes I'm writing late at night or I'm podcasting late at night or I'm like just throwing together a sub stack. I- I'm at a point right now where I I can't stop working. Yeah. And yeah. I think I think the way to do that is to just keep working and finding new outlets. Like tonight I'm doing a I'm doing another podcast in an hour and a half. And yeah. then um maybe I'm gonna I gotta tomorrow morning I gotta finish up this little article. Like the more you work it's like it's like putting like get you ever do you work on cars? I used to work on cars. My ex taught me no, how to I work wouldn't. on a straight eight. Like so I had an old straight eight seventy two so and it was like you gotta get it started pour a little gas on the carburetor. You're it's like, like my my hero. Just oh wow well, I haven't done it in years, but it was fun. It was fun. So yeah just I, I think the way to keep writing is lit. I, I I hate to tell you, it's just to write. And if you need yeah. to, I've done this before. There is, I do have a, I have a little app on my computer. I use sometimes called Freedom. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And I don't Shout use it a lot. But I definitely will use it. Like when I've got a future man and I got to get through, and it's like, what? I'll, okay, here is an actual tip. All right, you throw your Freedom app on just for an hour. Don't go crazy. Don't do five hours. You know you're gonna fuck up. Then you keep a pad on your right or your left, if you're a lefty and everything you need to look up on the internet, like, oh shit, I got to find out if it was yeah. 72. Now. Just write it down and do it when that hour is over. Yeah. And then you know what? Do it again. Yeah. And you will get, you will get two days worth of work done in two hours. I know. You've kept that's yourself so offline. Crazy. So that's uh that's my tip. <laughs> that's a good tip actually. Yeah. And what is your biggest defect of character or vice or however you want to interpret that? Could be whatever you're working on on yourself, what gets in your way. I, I, and defective, any way you want to interpret it. Defective character. Well, I probably drink a little too much, but it's a lot less than before. So I don't know. I guess I'm kind of fixing that. I, I'm not good at, I'm not good at like keeping a schedule. I don't know if I want to. I guess I don't want to because I don't really keep. Uh, like a strict regime. But when I have, like I have my last book, the, To the Bridge, um, like I get very, very monastic when I have to do a good, a big project. And it's my happiest times of my life when I like get up at the same time, eat the same breakfast, do the same work, walk yeah. at the same hour, go to like everything exactly the same. They're like, it's 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 absolute freedom. Structure equals yeah. freedom. But I'm, yeah. I'm terrible at it. So I, I maybe that's, that maybe, maybe I should do more of that. I'm the same though. That's that whole, that's um Jack always says that discipline equals freedom. It is a structure equals freedom. Yeah. Absolutely. And but if because check it out. If you've got like no structure at all, <laughs> nothing gets go. done. Yeah, nothing gets done. It's like people are like, oh, do you hate deadlines? It's like, do I hate deadlines? I love deadlines. I love yeah, deadlines I need them. because absolutely a hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, and, I and, I intentionally put working out with my little the women in my community and at noon every day. Mm-hmm. Monday through Friday, because I it forces me to build my day around it. It's like the one thing that I can like build my day around. I'm like, well, I know I have this at noon and I now, um, yeah, I'm just so much more productive. Just having that one thing that I have to do every day. I'm on my way. <laughs> I, I, I 
would totally do it with you. Mom, <laughs> okay. I'll give you the link. All right. Well, I'll be there soon. I'll be picking you up in the uh, in the new car that I buy. Ooh, so, what's yeah. your um, biggest asset other than just your joy and enthusiasm and love of life mm-hmm. and people? My child. Oh, uh, I, I mean, you know, she's 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 the best. And I think also something happened like when my life kind of blew up. Just uh, the real desire to reach out and hang out with the people that I think are amazing. And I, I do it immediately now. I'm like, oh, Michael Powell, you're so amazing. You write great stuff for the New York Times. Hi, I'm Nancy Roman. Oh, I know who you are. Great. Let's go get a cup of coffee. It's just like, do it now. Like yeah. I had a, a years and years ago, I had a couple, they gave me this beautiful bar of soap in like a fancy box, like fancy, fancy, fancy. And I stuck it in the linen closet. And five years later, it's still there. I'm like, Use the good soap now. What are you waiting for? So like use the good soap now. Reach out to the people that you think are amazing. Okay, just do it. Build some stuff. Make some mistakes. You know, have some fun. Bring some joy to the world. Like just do it. That that would, I would say right now, I would, maybe that's an asset. It's become a way to live and I'm, it's working out. I love that. It's also the theme. I have a newsletter, but it's not like on Substack. I basically just write a weekly little thing and I link to like all the things I did that uh-huh. week and my uh-huh. it's just a new uh, like email that goes out it was today's titled was start today and it's all about that I'm like just just do it I don't care what it is just start it there's just so much energy in starting something and also give it away um I do that too with my newsletter it's like if you read something great if you eat something great if you heard a freaking song that made you like dance around in your socks Give it away because that people love it. It's so nourishing. So yes, you give it all away. This, you said something to me when we were at dinner that really stuck with me actually about just the creative force belongs to everybody and how there's, you know, this, this kind of sense of ownership. Like if you take a recipe and then make it better and do oh. another thing with it, like take it and go do something. Take it, take it. I always thought it, cause I'm a big cook. I'm like, I always thought it's so weird. Like you can't give away recipes, give the recipe away because yeah. it's not yours anyway. And I mean, whatever there, that person is going to make it their own. Yeah. And yes, just give it all, give it all away. I love that. I love you. You, I love you too. I'm so grateful for you (laughs) in my life. And I'm grateful that I hopefully expose you to a whole bunch of people who never get. I love it. Have hear you in conversation. And I hope they go find all your work. Where can we find you, your work? You can find so Nancy Rom, N A N C Y R O M M, is both my website, nancyrom.com, and at Nancy Rom on Twitter and probably on Instagram too. Um, I'm not on Facebook very much, but Nancy Rommelman, um, my book To the Bridge is on Amazon. Uh, And then the big things right now are the Paloma Media YouTube channel, if you want to go subscribe to that, or if you want to go um, subscribe to my Substack, it's nancyrommelman.substack.com, make more pie. I do some baking. We just have some fun over there. But again, I think we might have some um, some pretty interesting reporting coming up, and that'll be a good place to um, to check up on it as it happens. And I would love to see you there. And if you want to reach me, I'm very reachable, and I love to communicate. And thank you for having me, Bridget. Thank you. I love you. You okay. hope, everyone. <laughs> Bye. It's time for the weekly check-in with Bridget and Cousin Maggie. Maggie alerted me that... Well, I don't even really know where to begin for this check-in. Oh, God. Alleg- Are we actually going to talk about this? <laughs> yeah. I got obesity trending because I woke up on at 6 a.m. and started to tweet, which is never a good idea for me. <laughs> and I was just making a very simple observation that Krispy Kreme's giving away donuts every single day, mind you, for people who are vaccinated was ironic and kind of hilarious. Uh-huh. And I was like, everyone is, everything is so dumb, but everybody read it in very serious tone. And next thing you know, obesity is trending and Jamila Jamil is writing some long diatribe about how fat phobia is real. And I thought fat phobia was, people kept calling me fat phobic. <laughs> and I thought that it was being afraid of fat people. And I called Maggie, I'm like, Maggie, I'm not afraid of fat people. I can run faster than them. <laughs> I'm afraid of the I'm afraid of getting fat. That seems like a different thing. And I was like, Bridget, that's fat phobia. <laughs> that's not being afraid of fat people. <laughs> I thought it was like all of the other phobias and it was a fear of some kind of person. <laughs> 
I I was like, well, I am afraid of the fat girl inside of me who's trying to come out. <laughs> oh God, that was one of the funnier conversations that I've had in the last couple of weeks. People get so mad. They're like, <sighs> you're fat shaming people with this tweet. I was like, a, it's a, a very well documented fact that people who struggled with obesity were affected more by COVID. Right, they were the the kind of worse affected. Bill Maher's been saying this since day one, and as much as I hate to agree with Bill Maher, he was saying that if Dr. Fauci from the get-go when they knew all of this had just said, hey, this is affecting people who have um, who are overweight and have diabetes and you should probably try and lose some weight or at least watch it and get healthy and exercise more, it would have saved lives. Mm. And no, you can't say that anymore you because it's offensive anymore. to people and their delicate sensibilities. This is another hill I'm gonna die on, folks. I will die on the hill. I'm not shaming people for being fat. I will shame people for not taking responsibility for their own health and coming up with every freaking excuse. You should have read the comments. Uh huh. They were ridiculous. It I was did like, read some of the comments. Oh my God. It was like, I'm a victim I, I, because of my trauma and also because of my, this is also ableist of you. Uh, it was just like, you because guys. Because you called everyone dumb. That was why <laughs> <laughs> that's also ableist language. <laughs> everyone is so dumb. Everyone is so dumb. Everything is so dumb. It, it, yeah. No. I mean, we've talked about this. Like, yeah, I'm like, I, if I make poor food choices and don't, don't exercise and I'm struggling with my weight, that's on me. Everyone wants an excuse. And a lot of people have, you know, some people have medical conditions and, and some people really do. Like they, they work out and they work hard and they are larger and that's, that's fine, but is it's about living a healthy lifestyle than more than anything and taking care of yourself and taking care of your body. Yeah, it's hard. It's a hard thing to, I mean, the people who I know who are like in insanely good, ridiculous shape work really hard at it. Like Lenny Kravitz. Like Lenny Kravitz. <laughs> But not just the rich people, the poor people I know who are yeah. in shape. <laughs> yeah. Because that's the other thing. People are like, oh, it must be easy to eat well and work out when you have money. I'm like, no, it's not. I did. I was skinnier when I was poorer than I am now. Uh-huh. Now that I'm all fat and happy. Uh-huh. When I just had to run up and down mountains with autistic kids to make my barely wages to make soup and toast for one meal a day. Yeah. And we went on the master <laughs> cleanse because we couldn't afford food. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. People get so mad and it always cracks me up. They're like, this is outrageous. And then they're like, one donut a day isn't going to cause obesity. I was like, yes, it is. Yeah, one donut a day is terrible That's for you. Four Donuts <laughs> are awful for you. That's four. First of all, it's 1,400 extra calories a week, Ugh. which if you do nothing, if you're not doing anything extra, like, how much you have to do to burn 200 calories, which is like a 40 minute super hard workout. Yeah. You are going to get fat. No, one donut a month is like, <laughs> oh, the puppies are playing outside. Yeah. One donut a day <laughs> is not good. Everyone's like, we think it's a genius. I'm like, yeah, it's genius because they're like, oh, they're trying to encourage people who are obese to get vaccinated, but you're still causing more of a problem. No, they're just trying to get people hooked on their product, yeah. which is, you know, which is like crap. winning. <laughs> yeah. Which I'm all for. And that's the other thing. People are like, why are you giving people crap? I'm like, I don't give a shit if somebody eats a donut every day. It's not my life. I'm not the one who's going to have to be forklifted out of a house. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to spread awareness. <laughs> I feel like this is a design flaw of the human body. Ugh. I feel like just our whole culture right now, it's all just a, like, it, it's all just, let's blame everything <laughs> external around us rather than taking responsibility for ourselves. Yeah, and I hate that. It's so stupid. Yes, and that's ableist language and I'm using it. <laughs> There's no language you're allowed to use. No. And then I, someone's like, we're gonna all be miming soon. I'm like, no, because silence is violence too. <laughs> Literally everything is violence, but violence. <laughs> Speech is violence, silence is violence. Violence, not violence. Violence is the, the language of the unheard. The language of the oppressed. <laughs> <laughs> We'd like to thank our sponsors this week, Freshly and Calm. 
Freshly is amazing. They offer chef-made, nutrient-packed, delicious meals delivered fresh to your door. Go to Freshly.com slash walk-in for $40 off your first two orders. For listeners of the show, Calm is offering a special limited time promotion of 40% off a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash walk-in. Tune in next week for another riveting episode that will change your life, help you get out of your own way, and solve all the world's problems. I want to thank our composer, Jared Elias, my co-producer and cousin, Maggie, and all of you out there listening. This has been Walk-In's Welcome with Bridget Phetasy. I'm Bridget Phetasy, and you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> it's the dumbest line. <laughs>